few weeks ago, a Macon County judge declared a final judgment on the state's semi-automatic weapons ban uh, on a circuit court level saying that the law is unconstitutional because it violates the equal protections. As the law carves out, law enforcement and others in the security space is not having to comply with the semi-automatic weapons ban that Governor J.B. Pritzker signed into law January 10th, just about uh, two months or so ago. And there's been litigation, of course, filed in federal court. Uh, We'll touch on that a bit. But on the state court side, you've got Illinois State Police putting out a frequently asked question that we reviewed briefly last week. Uh, But really, I mean, it says that uh, after the Macon County case, uh, uh, it does not uh, strike down the law. It says here, and they're frequently asked questions with Illinois State Police. Does the Macon County case 2023 completely strike down the Protect Illinois Communities Act and render it unenforceable across Illinois? It says the Macon County judgment and any TROs entered in any actions only are applicable to the specific plaintiffs and defensives, defense uh, in those cases. Uh, most information will be forthcoming. More information as additional rulings transpire in state and federal court. So we have, of course, the uh, pending case from Macon County going to the Illinois Supreme Court. We'll be watching that closely. But in the meantime, I don't know if that was enough to satisfy everybody because really, I mean, it's there's some weird loopholes in that statement. So I had asked after uh, first requesting a comment on enforcement from Illinois State Police and getting this response, and I shared this on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had asked if they're enforcing after the Macon County case and they said isp is not taking any actions inconsistent with the various court orders and cases isp will continue to follow guidance from the ag's office so i then put a foia request in to get that guidance put that request into illinois state police and they essentially said uh subject to the requirements the following shall be exempt from inspection and copying communications between a public body and an attorney or auditor representing the public body that would not be subject to discovery in litigation and materials prepared or complied by or for a public body in anticipation of a criminal, civil, or administrative proceedings upon the request of the attorney advising the public body and materials prepared or compiled with the respect of internal audits and public bodies. What does that mean? It means essentially that is you, the taxpayer, is me, the media, I can't get information about what the specific guidance from the attorney general's office to the Illinois State Police is. From how I read that, it seems to be attorney-client privilege, which, uh, again, the attorney being the attorney general in this case. So Illinois State Police essentially saying it's attorney-client privilege and they can't provide me the guidance that they have. But I didn't just put a FOIA into Illinois State Police. I also put a FOIA into the Illinois Attorney General's office uh, to see if they could provide the guidance that they have given Illinois State Police after the Macon County case. And they replied, uh, essentially saying uh, somewhat of a uh, of a similar thing, uh, saying that there were going to be some redactions. You've requested, um, it's, re- it's granted in part and denied in part, they said. Uh, we have withheld no records. However, we've redacted information uh, to sections, it goes into the FOIA law, as amended by the Public Act, effective January 1st, 2023. Effective January 1st, 2023, uh, several laws are impacting FOIA. It exempts from disclosure preliminary drafts, notes, recommendations, memoranda, and other records in which opinions are expressed or policies or actions are formulated. The records that we have redacted consist of communication between Illinois State Police written for the purpose of planning courses of action with regard to potential litigation and interpretation of court rulings. They are exempt possible uh, under the rationale the public bodies must be able to evaluate information internally and explore possible courses of action confidentially. So again, um, attorney-client privilege, but who's the client? Is it the government? Aren't the taxpayers the government? Shouldn't the taxpayers be able to see this information? Uh, so it's it's interesting to see this argument, and uh, the Illinois Attorney General's office did provide me some back-and-forth emails. Uh, all of it mostly is redacted, except for one one email going out uh, from Abby Scro to uh, Darren Kincaid, an attorney who's been arguing on behalf of the governor 
and others saying that, uh, you know, hey, I'm in a meeting right now. I'll call you after with the subject Macon County court order. This was the day before the Macon County case was issued. And then you get, uh, yeah, give me a call. And then uh, yeah, it's redacted. And then you get more redactions. Uh, and even more redactions that are offered. Uh, so not a whole lot of um, uh, information provided in as far as uh, what exactly that guidance is from the Illinois Attorney General's office to the Illinois State Police, who's under a separate constitutional officer. The governor is not the same office as the Attorney General. However, the Attorney General is representing the governor and the Illinois State Police. What's that guidance been after the Macon County case? That's just the Macon County. This is this is all state level, all right? We're not talking about the federal courts yet, which we'll get to in a moment uh, to look a little bit more detail in uh, how the federal uh, court is proceeding. But at least in the state level court, you got the Macon County case that's on a circuit court level has said that the law is unconstitutional. Illinois State Police on their public-facing website saying that that does not strike down the law statewide, and they're just following guidance from the Attorney General's office. But to get that actual legal guidance from the Illinois Attorney General's office, which I requested through the Freedom of Information Act because a just simple email request, multiple, did not produce any response, uh, I did get a response from the Illinois State Police saying they're following guidance from the Attorney General, but through the Freedom of Information Act, I can't get that guidance Apparently because it's attorney-client privilege between the attorney, the attorney general, and the client, Governor J.B. Pritzker, in defense against challenges of Illinois' gun ban. So uh, that's where we are, at least in, in my understanding of the enforcement uh, that's being done. Uh, I do have a uh, another FOIA I'm crafting to essentially get uh, any police reports uh, that uh, there are since January 10th about the enforcement of the Protect Illinois Communities Act so we can see how this is being enforced uh, as it uh, goes on and, and is challenged. All right, stay tuned. we got a lot more to get to, including delving a little bit further into the federal case and uh, the four consolidated cases in the Southern District. We've got several filings that have happened late last week and even on on Friday uh, with an amicus brief filed. So we'll look at some of that. Stay tuned. It is Springfield's Morning News. I'm Greg Bishop on W. We've been getting out the latest in the back and forth of litigation against Illinois' gun ban and talking about the Freedom of Information Act requests that I put out to get the guidance that the Illinois Attorney General's office provided to Illinois State Police after the Macon County decision that the law was unconstitutional. And the Illinois State Police on their public-facing website says that the Macon County case does not strike down the law statewide, despite the attorney for Dan Calkins who brought that case uh, making the uh, claim that it does, because anybody who uh, wants to enforce a law that's been adjudicated unconstitutional, he says, could be uh, you know uh, looking at severe uh, liabilities uh, for for violating somebody's civil liberties. Uh, but uh, that's you know all in, in uh, looking at the trajectory of the state level case going to the Illinois Supreme Court. And that's the Calkins case from Macon County. The Illinois Supreme Court has agreed to hear that. They are set to hear that in mid-May. Of course, you've got the ongoing story of a million-dollar donation to each of two Illinois Supreme Court justice candidates that Governor J.B. Pritzker gave. And those candidates are on the bench. They sat in on the oral arguments for the no-cash bail law where the governor was a top defendant. That signals they could be on the bench whenever they hear the, uh, the gun ban case in mid-May where the governor, again, is a top defendant in that as somebody who signed that law into effect. Uh, but with that state level uh, ongoing back and forth, you've got an interesting development that uh, was filed on Friday in the Effingham County case that's brought by the Illinois attorney. Thomas DeVore. Uh, this case, of course, is the uh, part of the, the consolidated cases that DeVore wanted to have. DeVore wanted to take his three cases, two from Effingham, one from White, and to have them consolidated with the Macon County case. The Supreme Court said, no, the Macon County case is going to stand alone, and DeVore's three cases can be consolidated moving forward. DeVore amended that, added even more people to the temporary restraining orders that they have for that. But this is interesting because 
now you have an effort to hold Tom DeVore's cases. Uh, and we're looking here at the dockets through Judici, uh, Effingham County, Illinois. And then this case on Friday, the governor and the attorney general joined her in the legislative defendant's motion to stay proceedings pending the Supreme Court's review of plaintiff's claims filed by um, the attorney for the attorney general. So uh, they're looking to what? To hold this? Is that what the, is that how I'm reading it? As me, a lay person, not an attorney? Is that how I read this? That uh, the attorney general is looking to uh, stay any proceedings in this case pending the state's Supreme Court's review. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that case, but interesting to see. So those are the state level issues. Let's now change our focus to the federal courts, where in the Southern District, you've got four cases that were filed against the state's gun ban from earlier this year, January 10th, when the governor enacted it, the Protect Illinois Communities Act, and you had uh, four federal cases that were filed. One was actually filed in state court, Crawford County, that was transferred to federal court, but you had another one that was filed by the National Shooting Sports Foundation, a third that was filed by the Illinois State Rifle Association, and a fourth that was filed by the Federal Firearms Licensees of Illinois. So those cases have been consolidated in the Southern District, and we touched on this briefly last week, uh, but uh, just a little bit more detail here. Uh, the states did respond to each of the individual cases that were brought forward, despite them being all consolidated. Uh, but looking at the response they have, the answers that the state has to make, uh, just in particular in the Federal Firearms Licensees of Illinois lawsuit that was brought, uh, just to kind of give you a back and forth here, it's dozens of pages. We touched on this Friday, but uh, it looks like, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Federal Firearms Licensees case says, uh, if the right to keep and bear arms means anything, it must mean that the government cannot ban the most popular firearms in the country, like the class of firearms known as magazine-fed semi-automatics. It goes on to say the Second Amendment of the Constitution squarely protects plaintiffs' rights to keep and bear arms, which are typically possessed by law-abiding citizens and lawful purposes. The defendant answers to that. They deny the allegation in the paragraph that you have act a right to, as a Second Amendment, have semi-automatic magazine-fed firearms. Uh, the, the defendants, the state, admits that uh, FN1 quotes a portion of the District of Columbia Heller, but they deny the remaining allegations. And that's really where this kind of goes, right? Another uh, allegation here is, for example, certain rifles like the ubiquitous AR-15, which has been on the market for over 60 years uh, and which is owned by many millions of law-abiding Americans, easily meets that description defendants deny the allegation in the paragraph and they go on and, and it goes back and forth where the defendants deny uh, whatever allegation or they may partially confirm as we see with the the Barnett answers where the state had to respond to you know some of the uh, the pull quotes from the uh, Bruin decision that the Barnett plaintiffs brought forward uh, defendants admit the paragraph contains partial quotes of Bruin but defendants deny that the excerpts of the allegations accurately characterize which weapons are protected by the text and history of the Second Amendment. Again, this is dozens of pages. This one alone is 27 pages. The Federal Firearms Licensees of Illinois lawsuits, 43 pages, where the state has to respond to that. So you can, if you get a chance, you likely can find these online. Uh, maybe if you email me, I could probably get you a copy, bishoponair at gmail.com. But uh, also, uh, late last week, you had another amicus brief. An amicus brief is a friend of the court brief, and that was filed uh, last week with the Illinois Sheriff's Association filing in support of the plaintiffs wanting to block this law, uh, saying that it's unconstitutional and sheriffs aren't going to enforce an unconstitutional law. Uh, you also had an amicus brief filed by every town, uh, and that's a gun control group, and they said that you know people are misinterpreting the Bruin decision and we have a right to you know, uh, prohibit what kinds of firearms can be purchased or owned. Uh, but uh, we had another amicus brief filed, and this one was from uh, the Second Amendment um, Law Center. And just to kind of go through this a bit, uh, they, uh, of course, give their table of contents, uh, which really gives you a, a general idea of what they're going to be saying, right? Uh, so the appropriate time to determine the uh, original public understanding of the Second Amendment is 1791, when the Bill of Rights was adopted. 
Uh, briefing in this case that suggests or advocates that the time to determine the original meaning of the Bill of Rights is when the 14th Amendment was ratified is seriously in error, they say. Uh, the case law and quotations relied on the established 1868 and the, per, uh, the pertinent year are uh, illusory. Uh, the Constitution's meanings fixed according to the understandings of the founders. Each provision of the Bill of Rights means the same thing when applied against the state through the 14th Amendment as it does when applied against the federal government. So you can see here that uh, they go into you know their conclusions. Let's just see what they say in page 19, where uh, they ultimately say, um, the motion for preliminary injunction should be granted. <laughs> so uh, they go through a lot of legalese pointing to the Second Amendment and its founding uh, and uh, the, the reason for the Second Amendment and when you should uh, use uh, you know what what era you should use to interpret the Second Amendment text and history, uh, and this obviously is a uh, pro Second Amendment group filing that they want to see a preliminary injunction granted in the Southern District. So you've got all of these back and forths, these filings that are happening, right? Uh, and then you're going to have oral arguments in the federal court, Southern District, St. Louis, May. Uh, April 12th is when that's going to be April 12th. They're going to have their oral arguments. Will the judge rule from the bench to put a temporary uh, a preliminary injunction in place? That's a big question. Uh, or will he take it under advisement? Uh, same with the uh, Illinois Supreme Court. They're going to be taking uh, up the state challenge uh, in mid-May. That's the last stop for the state challenge from the Macon County case. Will divorce case be able to advance if the Macon case doesn't uh, get across the finish line or is, is kicked back down to the lower court? Who knows? We'll watch that closely. But that's the last stop, the Illinois Supreme Court, for the state-level cases. It's the federal courts where you're really going to see that possibly get kicked up to the federal appellate court and then possibly up to the U.S. Supreme Court. So we'll be watching all of this closely and keeping you updated on the very latest. But a lot of filings back and forth and a lot of paper that uh, is going to be on the judge's desk to have to sort through.